the title of my talk is uh, Auto Database at Sanity. Another title is Syntax Error, because there is no such command in Postgres. And I will be talking about uh, preventing disasters. Now, um, Gabriel from Second Quadrant uh, delivered a very nice talk on Barman and uh, how you can um, recover from disasters using Barman. But my talk will be how do you prevent disasters because you don't want them to happen altogether. And uh, I work for Zalando. Zalando is a, a big company in Europe. We probably sell more shoes than any other company in Europe, at least most of the companies. And uh, our marketing department is very uh, uh, sensitive about the numbers of customers we have, but I will just say that we have millions of transactions and Postgres is the system that supports most of them. So we have a big technology stack and uh, really a lot of technologies are involved in making our customers happy and making us happy as well and sleep at night. So all our components are interconnected. Uh, somehow, unfortunately, they are interconnected through the database. And this requires additional attention from us uh, because we want to make sure that no single change will break the database and the shop should run uh, without any downtimes. And our customers are really crazy. Uh, sometimes they shop at 2 a.m. Sometimes they shop at, during the day, during the holidays, 24-7. So we really have to make sure that our database is also run 24-7 and we don't, have, uh, we don't have a possibility for downtimes. We don't have this luxury. Uh, so I want to talk to you about how do we change the, the databases. So Valentin, was, Valentin is here. He was talking about how Postgres is easy. But to make Postgres really easy, you have to think about your process of uh, development and you, not only the software development, but the database development. And uh, I would first talk about the changes uh, in your database, about what possible problems one can encounter by, um, doing, by changing the data in the database. And uh, I will also cover some tools that makes this process uh, more easy. And I will talk how in Zalando we use those and uh, other open source tools to make sure that our databases are always available. So let's cover the database changes. Uh, usually there are three of them. The model change, which uh, changes the scheme of your databases. This is what you do when you develop your application. And for instance, add columns or add tables and add foreign keys. All this involves model changes and these changes are pretty so applications are usually very sensitive to these changes because if the application uh, expects uh, a certain table and the table is not there, then the application just breaks. So you have to make sure that changes are tracked. The others one are not really less important, the data changes. Uh, usually it's uh, data migrations. Uh, for instance, you may decide to populate your table after you edit it, for instance, with the uh, customers or you may decide to update your table to correct some error, and the table may be 10 gigabytes, and it might take uh, quite a lot of time for you to do this. And the third level, of third uh, change, uh, the, the third type of changes is the changes to your code and to database functions, if you use database functions. And uh, this also involves uh, some issues, uh, which I will cover. So there are different uh, types of changes, and uh, yeah. So this guy is expert for changes, changes that work for you, but sometimes they don't work in production. So we want to, I want to, to talk uh, shortly about some horror stories, and these horror stories are based on real events, but all the table names and column names are changed. So one of them is, starts like this. You get an internal error. And you see developers uh, running to you and uh, saying some uh, loud stuff, and they are definitely not happy. So you start looking at the logs to see what caused this error, and you get to the application, you get to the Postgres log, and you see this uh, query. This is just a select. So you check the table is there, but you see that the column that is trying to use is not there. And you go to the logs a little bit upward, and you see that this column was dropped by the developer. So some developer decided this is a good idea because the column is obsolete, and why would you keep this? We can save the space in the database, and it just went to the database via psql and dropped this column. And now we have an application that is not running. Uh, for sure, this is uh, once we diagnose this problem, 
it may be easy to fix or it may not, depending on the content of this column. But what we want to do is not to fix the problem afterwards. We want to prevent such kinds of problems. And for this, we need to be able to track uh, what statements are executed against the live database. And better, we want to actually test these statements before on some staging systems, before running them directly on production. So I want to also cover such so, so one thing that is related to the logs. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too dark. But we have a tool that allows you to show the running uh, processes on the database. It is similar to the top, but uh, specific to Postgres. Uh, it shows you some uh, system statistics, and it also shows you what kind of queries are executed uh, currently, basically the contents of PG start activity at a given time, and it updates in real time. Uh, so what we can see here is that out table uh, took a lock on the database and uh, forced all other processes to wait on this lock. And uh, the developer thought this auto table is very lightweight because the table it tries to alter is almost an empty table. It has eight kilobytes. So what can possibly go wrong? The eight kilobytes table, auto table will run in an instance. But what actually happened is that someone was doing select from this table before. And how Postgres works? So the, the auto table acquires a very heavy weight lock, the access exclusive lock. It uh, conflicts with anything. The select statement acquires a very lightweight lock, access share lock. It conflicts with nothing but this access exclusive lock. And what happens is that auto table have to wait for the long running select to finish. And all the subsequent processes were just queued. No matter what type of lock they try to acquire, they just they were put in the queue waiting for this auto table to finish. And this causes the application to get timeouts, and this causes the customers to be unhappy. And we like unhappy customers, so we want to test everything. So if you are this guy and you test everything on production, then you may not leave this talk and continue, because we have some good news for you, and we have some good tools for you to prevent you from doing these things. But I first want to, I want to cover another horror story that involves Sprocks and also show one of our tools, uh, the open source tool called PG Observer. Um, yeah, it doesn't have a light mode, unfortunately. It's only dark mode. We, we like darkness in our database team. But what you can see is the development is the uh, running time for the Sproc, the sp stored procedure that was recently deployed. And the red line delimits the uh, running time of the stored procedure before uh, the, de the deployment and after the deployment. And you can immediately see that the time after the deployment just skyrocketed, so it jumped 10 times or even more. And this, also, this resulted in a lot of timeouts and you know the rest of the story. You don't want to be this guy. So the Sprox also has to be tracked, the Sprox has to be tested, and the, one has to be aware which Sprox are running on your database. So what I want to take are some techniques that are usually used for the source code of the application and uh, transfer these techniques to the database development. So these are, for instance, version controlling. How many of you have your application under version control? Good. How many of you have your database code under version control? OK. Quite a lot of people, I can say. And uh, unit testing. How many of you do unit testing for your database changes? Valentin, raise your hand. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so also, how many of you have staging environments for your databases? Yes. This is very good. <laughs> awesome. And the last thing is the special deployments for your database changes. So you may be aware that at the given time your database changes, and it's not like your database is changing constantly because someone go in and drop in your columns and then your application stops working. So this is things we will have tooling for. And I want to mention that Postgres is really very good for doing structural changes and for supporting these kinds of tools is insanely great for saying database changes because it's fully ACID compliant, meaning that you always have your data. Once you edit your data to the database, you have your data there. Who actually knows how ACID is uh, translated? No one? OK. Atomic, consistent. Isolation. Isolation. Very good. And the last one? 
durability, exactly. So Postgres is durable, but once you put the data there, the data stays there. This is very good because you cannot test the database that it just doesn't retain the data you put there. It's not a database. Uh, the one thing that is very important is transactional DDLs. It's uh, amazingly important for testing because uh, you can actually say something like auto database, auto table at column, and you roll back this transaction and the column is not added. The database is in this state like before the transaction. And you can write a lot of tests, like adding a column, putting some data into the column, adding a foreign key, seeing if it works or not. So all of this is possible with transactional DDO. Is Postgres is quite unique in this regard. There are a lot of other commercial databases that doesn't support this feature. So you can write stored procedures in different languages, and this encourages you to use the stored procedures instead of writing your code inside, writing your SQL inside your code. And the, the last thing I will cover is it's also allows you to select which uh, function, which store procedure you run via this mechanism called the search path. So all of this makes writing tools to have structural deployment and change management in Postgres uh, quite easy. And the first tool I want to cover, called Sketch, uh, is the tool that is written by David Wheeler from Portland. Uh, he's a Postgres hacker that usually come, name, uh, goes by the name of Theory. And he wrote quite a lot of amazing tools. And Sketch is one of the tools I learned and uh, actually evaluated quite extensively. So you use this tool to create atomic database changes step by step. Uh, he says about this as an agile database development. So you don't throw all the schema at once, but you create table by table, column by column in small change sets. And uh, it actually integrates with your version control system, for instance, like Git. So uh, it has support for merging uh, different uh, changes from different branches and resolving the conflicts that may occur during this merging. Uh, this tool is also, so it uh, has an explicit change uh, um, plan that allows you to write changes and always know in which direction, this ch in which uh, order these changes will be applied to the database. Uh, the process that you use to, with this tool is a, uh, deploy, verify, uh, deploy, reward, verify process. So you write the deployment scripts, you write the scripts to roll back your deployments in case something is wrong or in case you just want to revert your testing environment to the initial stage. And you also write the verify scripts and this is a very interesting concept. So you write scripts to test your changes and I will show you right, uh, how these scripts are looked. So, and uh, one of the ideas here is you run your change sets, you then deploy it on your testing environment, on your staging database, which might even run on your local laptop. Then you make sure that these changes actually work, and then you put them into production. So, how this works? You, it's very easy to convert your existing code into Sketch. You basically, um, so here I just uh, initialized the new Git repository, but it's not necessary to be Git. Then I just said, OK, give me the engine Postgres, uh, give me the project name pgconf US, and give me the URI, which allows you to have actually multiple projects and have dependencies, between, interdependencies between projects. So and it creates some files. It creates the configuration, which allows you to specify the connection string for the database, among other things. The sketch plan, which uh, shows uh, the order of execution of your change sets and these three directories uh, that will contain the actual change sets. And uh, so let's create uh, our first change set here. Uh, I will add the application role that will control how my which role will run my application. And uh, it creates three files for me and uh, says that it added this change to the sketch, sketch plan. So this is how the change look, looks like. It's always inside the transaction, because uh, if it's inside the transaction, uh, you can guarantee, because of this uh, atomic function of databases, that you either apply it completely or nothing is applied. So this is a transaction, and there there is a simple statement that just creates a role for me. And Sketch is also adding some commands to the beginning of this file. It says which deployment is it. So the verify script is also quite easy. What we have to verify is this role, that this role exists. And what we do is we just check that Postgres has this role and uh, we have usage rights on this role. So if we uh, 
run this statement and the row is not there, then it will throw an error and Sketch will actually work with you and process this error as a failed test and report that you cannot uh, deploy your change because the test has failed. And this one has a rollback at the end because we don't, sometimes we don't want uh, the tests to affect our databases. And uh, how do we deploy these things? This is very easy. You create the data, I create the test database. I say deploy with a given, with a given database stream. This uh, database stream can actually be hard-coded inside, not hard-coded, but added to this Kitch conf, so you don't have to specify it all the time. Uh, and then it will just uh, apply my change to database and says, okay, this change is applied. Uh, I can add another change, and in the second change, I say that this change depends on the first one. So I want to create a schema for my database, and uh, to create a schema, I want to have a user in place because I will run this schema to the user. So I do this, and uh, th this basically the same command, just minus r thing that says uh, it's a dependency. And uh, it, sets, it adds uh, these uh, new files for the change. Each change has its own file. And it also adds, my, uh, it adds a string to the sketch plan. So this is how the, depend how the change with the dependency works, uh, looks like. It's basically the new string in the command that says it requires a pro, it requires the previous uh, uh, dependency. And you won't be able to deploy this uh, uh, script uh, if you didn't deploy the app schema first. Uh, now I want to notice, note that Sketch does not try to resolve the dependencies for you. This is still your job. It, what it tries to do is to make sure that you don't uh, deploy your dependency, uh, so is that you have all the dependencies in place before you deploy your scripts. So this is how the verify part, oh, sorry, this is how revert part looks like. I just drop the schema if I, don't, uh, if I want to roll back this change. And the verify part is also quite easy. Uh, what I want to do is to check that the information schema contains this uh, a name. And uh, if it doesn't contain this name, I want it to throw an error. And one technique to throw an error is to just do divide by zero. So here, I just divide by zero. And if there is no schema, it will show me the divide by zero error. And Sketch will process it and say something is wrong. OK, so this is uh, what I do afterwards on my test environment. I want to start to roll, to roll out all the uh, changes from scratch. I don't want, uh, so I want to have a clear data, clean database before I roll out all of my changes. So I just say revert to my previous approach change and then I deploy. And during the deploy, it will roll out all the changes from the plan. So now I have a database which has its approach and app schema. And all of this depends on the plan file. So this plan file contains the, some, some metadata, like syntax version and name of the project, which is important because you have multiple projects in your database. And what it actually has is the exact uh, change names, the timestamps, uh, and the author of these changes, and the commands that you specified when you created your changes. And you can also see that for the app schema, it has a dependency in the brackets for the app row. So you can actually take a look at the plan, or you can even edit this plan manually if you don't like how the changes are structured for you. And then Sketch will instantly catch it up and uh, run the changes in your desired order. So Sketch also supports uh, development in branches. Uh, so you might uh, actually have a branch for each of your database change, then do something in this branch, and then might uh, merge this branch back to the master branch. And the problem with the merge happens because uh, this, the plan file is the single file in the project. And every change adds something to this plan file. So if uh, two different uh, changes uh, in two different branches uh, modify your plan file, then some of the changes, then during the merge file, you get a conflict. And you get a conflict like this. So one change. Uh, I added the talk uh, table to our pgconf project. Another, table, another change added the speaker table. And uh, since both of them try to modify the plan file, uh, the, mer the merge just failed, and we have to do something to resolve it. But happily, we have the uh, support for resolving such conflicts in Git. Uh, this, uh, you can specify what kind of merge you use in Git. And you can say that you want a union merge. And the union merge. Uh, instructs Git to actually take uh, uh, non-matching lines from both files and combine them together. So at the end, you get a file which contains, change, which contains lines from both of your changes. 
And after you do this uh, merge with this union, there is a command that uh, you can go to your repository, put this command, and it will uh, convert the merge to union merge for the specific file, which is only sketch plan, since the other changes all reside in their separate uh, files. You only need to take care of sketch plan. And then there is a special command called sketch rebase. And what this command does is that it reverts all the changes for you and then applies them back. So once you merge your branches, you have uh, the content from both of them, you also want to start from scratch and test your changes. And this is what sketch rebase allows you to do. Of course, sometimes you want to see what kind of changes you already applied, and this is easy. You do sketch lock and it will show you what kind of changes you did. For instance, here it says I deployed a change called app schema, and it actually produces a one output like git lock, so I couldn't put it in one slide. On the second slide, this continuation, this is a revert command that says that I reverted the app schema. So it's important that sketch lock locks everything. Even your database is in an empty state because you applied some changes and then reverted the changes, everything is locked in sketch lock, so you can always see who applied the change that broke your application, or you can always use it for audit purposes. So how does it do this? How does it track these changes? Sketch relies on the metadata that is uh, in your database. There is a special schema that is called Sketch, and in this schema there are tables to track the changes, to track the dependencies, to track the projects, because you have, have multiple of them, and uh, some other uh, information, for instance, information about the tags. So, for instance, the, the tags is a very important feature in Sketch. Um, it's, uh, so, in order to roll out your changes from the uh, release to the production, what you want to do is to tag your changes, saying, okay, this change, uh, the, the set of changes uh, uh, from, uh, from the current one and before current one, all are ready for production. So, you say sketch tag, for instance, release 1.0, and then out of your repository, you just say sketch bundle. And the bundle will create a bundle for you. Basically, it's similar to git export. It exports the data, and then you can put your data, for instance, copy the data on the production server, and right, for with, right with this bundle directory, you go inside and you say sketch deploy, the name of the database, and instantly your changes are deployed on production. So it's a very easy release cycle. You test it on staging, you bundle, you tag it, you bundle it, and then you uh, roll out your bundle on production environment, and you get exactly the changes that you put on the testing environment, but running on production. So one interesting feature that I also want to cover is reworking. Um, usually when you create a new change in Sketch, you do it in the separate file. But sometimes it's not convenient. For instance, if you create a new version of your function and you're on, you only changed a couple of lines in this function, you don't want uh, a second uh, copy of your function in, in your Git tree. You actually want to use to leverage the tools you have in Git to see the history and to track your changes to the functions. You always want to see who changed what. Git is very good for this. So there is a concept on in-place changes in uh, Sketch. And uh, these changes, uh, so instead of writing new files for the change, uh, the revoke command copies the existing files. And then the new files are named with a tag that comes between the changes. And this tag uh, uh, actually marks the original change. And this leaves you free to edit the original file. So this is a little bit complicated, but I want to show you it and is an example. Suppose I have a function that, set, that says set talk and that sets the uh, information for this talk, and I want to revoke this function, so I set sketch revoke. And what it does, it adds the original file to the plan, but it actually renames this file. And the new name of this file contains a tag that I set before. So this uh, tag uh, distinguishes between the original file and the renamed one, and the new files that I have with the new th that I want that I will change uh, are those uh, files that are uh, that are shown uh, below. So this set talk in the deploy report and verify, uh, you you are actually free to change them further, and they will implicitly de depend on the previous version of these changes, which are marked with this tag. 
So if I do git status, uh, you will see these untracked files. These are the files with original changes that were added by Sketch. And there are also changes that are, uh, th there are also changes in the, uh, in the scripts. So what this rework also does is that it puts the uh, script that deploys the changes uh, as a script that reverts the changes so that you can revert the new changes to, this, to the structure that was before, to the structure of uh, version 1.0 of your file. So if you want to, rework, to revert your reworked changes, uh, Sketch wants to make sure that you will uh, revert it to the original version. And this uh, actually only works for some parts of changes. It works very good for functions, because you can do create or replace functions multiple times, and it will always bring you the version of the function that you want and probably won't work for things like auto table at column because um, you can do auto table uh, so, sorry not auto table at column but if you just put the new if you add the column to the table in the table definition and uh, by doing create table and you try to apply it over the existing table in the database it just won't work so there are only certain types of changes that you can rework and these changes should be idempotent it should be able, you should be able to apply it multiple times. So this is Sketch. It's uh, quite a powerful tool. Um, it has the, so the concepts are you have a deploy, verify, and a revert cycle. And you can instantly bundle your changes and put it in the production. And you can also do in-place in place, uh, modifications for some of the changes. The next tool that I want to cover is a little bit uh, more simple than Sketch. It's actually uh, very simple. It's called versioning, and for me, all the tools uh, that I see for managing database changes has very awkward names. This is probably the most uh, confusing name I have for the tool. What tool did you use? I use versioning. What? Versioning? What kind of versioning? Yeah, but this is the name of this tool. It's written by Depeche. It's capitalized. It's capitalized, yes. It's written by Depeche, the hacker from Poland. And uh, the idea of this tool is that instead uh, you, you try to isolate your changes in the uh, simple transactions, simple atom atomic transactions. And uh, so instead of making changes on development and finding differences between production and development, you just isolate your changes in atomic transactions and then roll out your changes on development and then roll out the same changes on transactions. So the concept is very similar to what we have in Sketch, but as I said, it's much, much easier. So it has also the notion of changes as atomic uh, files containing the transactions. It can track already applied files. It allows you to write rollback changes, and uh, it also can maintain dependencies for you. So you can always find out which change has to go before, the, before which one. So how the patch looks in uh, this uh, versioning tool, it's very easy. Uh, you get the transaction, and inside this transaction, you have to register this patch, and you have to supply the unique name for this patch. It should be unique among the databases. Then you get a change here, like auto table, for instance, and then you commit this change. So once you do this, you can apply this patch to your database, and uh, you can see if you try to apply it a second time, then the register patch function will catch that you already have this file in your database and will not allow you to do this. So every change can be applied only once, and no more than once. And also has the notion of rollbacks. You can write your rollback diff, and this rollback diff should cancel what you did in the uh, forward diff. Like here, we drop the table. And instead of register patch, it does the call the function that is called unregister patch. And this function removes the patch from the system table that tracks which patches are currently applied. So you can roll you can apply uh, you can uh, apply this patch for instance once again so uh, the rollback patches are especially recommended for some mission critical um, applications uh, uh, if you if you if you're not sure that your change will work with your software and you want to quickly revert this change then you just write the rollback patch and if something happens you quickly apply it so it has the concept of dependencies as i said you can set in the register patch you can uh, supply the dependencies and it will make sure that the dependencies are uh, already in the database before it tries to apply your page patch 
and it also one patch can depend on uh, multiple other patches. So it also have a co concept of conflicts. Uh, I don't show it here, but it works pretty much the same. You can say that a single patch conflicts with uh, some other one, and if some other one is applied to the database, then your patch will never be applied until you revert it. And uh, this is it. It's a very simple tool. It basically a couple of uh, screens written in PLPG SQL. It's very easy to uh, audit. It's very easy to see what it does. It's very easy to modify, if you like. And it has only one table in the database and a special schema, which, which uh, has the name of each patch, the timestamp when it's applied, the name of the person who applied it, and the um, requires and conflicts uh, to track the dependencies, which patches, which patches are required by the given one and, and which patches conflicts with the given one. So it's, uh, it's, it's really very lightweight. You can really start uh, using it without uh, much preparations. Just roll out a single SQL file on your database and start writing your divs in these uh, uh, enclosed in transactions uh, files, in, in patches enclosed in uh, transactions. So these are very similar but different tools. One is very simple, and it doesn't, it, it, it's uh, very easy to, to see what it does, very easy to understand. The other is a little bit more complex, but it's also more powerful. Uh, it has the notion of, uh, of, of uh, tests for your patches, and it cooperates with your version control system. So uh, I want to also mention some other tools. First is PGType. It's also written by theory. And uh, this tool uh, is uh, designed to uh, create unit tests inside your database. So if, he, uh, if you uh, saw the tests that we wrote here, uh, these tests are pretty crude. So <coughs> we use the functions that are uh, supplied by Postgres uh, in order to check that, for instance, the schema is there. But PGTAP is much more powerful to ask you to see, for instance, if the table is there, if the table has the structure uh, that you expect it to have, if the table has the proper defaults, if the table has foreign keys, if the function, for instance, that you defined has a certain string in the body, <coughs> if the function is uh, volatile or security defined, and so on. So basically, almost every feature that Postgres has is covered by one of the functions that uh, you have in PGTAP. So it's very uh, easy to write unit tests with PGTAP, and uh, it's also very easy to combine this sketch with PGTAP and write your full-scale unit tests for your changes. The other honorable mention is the Schema Evolution Manager made by Guild Group. It's similar to two tools that I already observed. Uh, uh, it's a little bit different. For instance, it doesn't have a notion of rollbacks because this guy says that you, uh, if you drop a column, that add a column is not a proper rollback because you already lost the data. But it may work or may not for work for you. It's written in Ruby. So if you like Ruby, you may check this out. And the other tool I want to cover and to mention only briefly is the <coughs> FDIF tool. As I said, all these tools have a very awkward names. And this tool is uh, designed to make sure that the modifications of your database functions uh, stay in sync with what you have in your version control system. Uh, and basically, it prevents. Uh, so you, 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 you get a snapshot of your functions in your database. And once you, once you apply it the new function, you can always check that the function that in the database after you applied it is the same. <coughs> That the function in your version control system. So it's basically designed for the environments when the multiple people can uh, modify your database uh, concurrently at the same time. And it might not might be or might not be a very good idea, but if you have such an environment, you can check this FDIF tool. So this is a tooling, and I want to show you the actual example of how do we use uh, some of these tools uh, in production. Uh, and um, B and Zalanda are very so we, we like the process that we have for our databases. Sorry. <clears throat> and this process consists of three parts. We have database divs, uh, basically the schema changes, which we use versioning for. Um, then we have the schema-based uh, API deployment. And we also have some tooling to make data migrations to make sure that one running transactions won't kill our databases. So first, how do we access the data? All our data access comes through these two procedures. And uh, we use the Java layer, which uh, <coughs> calls the special middleware, called Sprocker upper. 
and this proc wrapper makes all the hard work of translating Postgres types to Java types and back and forth. Uh, and it also locates the proper function inside the database from a Java standpoint. You only write a certain class, so you give some decorators, and then your function is magically translated to the uh, function inside the database. This thing is open source. Uh, if you go to the GitHub for Zalanda, then you will find all these tools and this proc wrapper as well. And uh, oh, the Java layer talks to the uh, Postgres layer, talks to the data layer about the stored procedures. We usually don't allow access via simple SQL statements, so we can control who actually access our databases, what iterations are performed on the databases. So we can always review the functions that we execute before they come into production. So our deployment procedures are very agile. We have a weekly deployment cycle for our code changes, and this also covers the database changes. And this means that every, every week, basically, uh, we receive sometimes uh, tens and up to hundreds of changes to our databases. So we really want to track these changes. We really want to make sure that we know what we put inside our database, what schema changes we do, so that it won't break the production. <laughs> because as I said, we have to have a maintain a 24-7 environment. And uh, we use the Git to track our code. And we also put the database files in Git as well. And we put change sets in the Git as well. And, uh, we have the notion of release branches. So once we have a deployment, the deployment always goes from the release branch. And this release branch is the branch that was tested. And this testing and reviewed and tested. And this review and testing includes the changes in the database. And uh, as I said, we don't, want to, we don't allow any downtime. And we don't have any downtime during our deployments. So this is how our Git structure looks like. Basically, our database files reside in the directory under the database. And the data directory contains full definitions for our schema. For instance, uh, such things as create table, the complete statements, or create type, or create function. And they also have the API, and the notion of API. This is the functions that interact directly with the application code in Java. Uh, so it goes to the separate uh, directory. And we also have these dbdfs, the change sets that are produced by the versioning. And these change sets are actually patches that we apply on top of our existing database uh, schema that is running on production. So if you want to add a column in the database, you write the change set that says auto table add column, and we put it into the dbdfs. And then we have a special tooling that can uh, find out which dbdfs we have to roll out, uh, depending on the current week number. Because we are from Germany, we use numbering for everywhere, for everything, including the our releases, and our releases are marked with weeks. So we find the proper week, we get the DVDs from there, and then we apply it first on staging and then on production. So yeah, I think uh, I already covered this. Uh, I want to talk now about the database diffs, these change sets. Uh, we use the versioning system that I was uh, talking before. And these changes, what is important, our development team is very big. I mean, hundreds of people, more than 500, I think. And we want to actually uh, get it twice as big as currently. But the number of database, peoples are, database people are, we only have 10 persons there, maybe even less now. And uh, it's physically not possible for database people to write all changes to the uh, data schema and to write all sprocs. So we don't write these things by ourselves. We let feature teams to do this. Our task is actually to review these changes and to make sure that these changes do not break the database. And um, also, we have a policy of avoiding uh, exclusive locks in our change sets. And we try to make uh, sure that uh, we try to avoid exclusive locks. And we have special uh, tricks to do this. For instance, here is the dbdiff that actually uh, runs the transaction that adds the column and adds the <coughs> new column uh, with the not now default value. Basically, if you do this in a single statement, auto table at column, not no default something, it will lock your table for the duration until, the, until it rewrites it completely. And for big tables, it might take quite a long time. And during this time, as I was showing on the previous slides, everything that tries to access this table is blocked. So basically, we can just use the normal auto table uh, form in our diffs. So what we do is uh, actually in the, in the inside the transaction, we only 
add the column without the uh, not now statement and we set a default value. And this thing doesn't lock the, doesn't lead to table rewrite. This thing is very fast. Basically, it's just a change in the system catalog. And all the heavyweight part that does the rewrite of the table that updates every row from the table, we put outside of the transaction. And as a final stage, after we made sure that all the rows are updated, we set it to not now. So <clears throat> at the end, the locks uh, that are acquired on this table are very minimal. We only acquire one lock for the outer table inside the transaction, uh, which is very small because it's a catalog rewrite, uh, sorry, catalog change. And the second one is we acquire the lock after the uh, update statement, and it's also quite fast because it doesn't involve rewriting of the table. So, and uh, this process also runs for other divs that has to, has to change the schema and has to acquire <coughs> heavyweight work. We try to avoid this. So we try to do uh, not to avoid duplicating the definitions of our database files. And for this, PSQL can work with us because there is a notion of adding the data to, uh, so inserting uh, other scripts in PSQL. Basically here we have the uh, patch uh, and in this patch we just add the new table. And what we could do is to just put create table inside this dbdiv. But then we had to do it twice. We had to put create table inside this dbdiv, and we also had to take do, to put the create table uh, in the directory, which uh, holds all our schema definitions in the data directory. That so basically here in the data directory, we, we, we would also put the same create table statement. So we want to avoid the duplication. So we just use the i command, which inserts the full contents of the given uh, file inside the database when we run this div. So each day dbdiv proceeds, proceeds, we proceed with dbdivs with a certain, uh, in a certain life cycle. First, it's uh, tested locally for the, uh, with the feature developers. Uh, we have a Vagrant box uh, and we have a virtual box that allows them to run Postgres on their machines. Then afterwards, we uh, run these uh, things on the release staging. And on the release staging, our QA teams goes there and tests uh, the changes to the database as a part of the overall testing. And after we make sure that uh, on release staging, everything works, uh, the patch is applied to the patch staging, which is a special environment we use to apply hot fixes to the production before they actually apply to production. And it's also applied to the live database. So generally, before it goes to live database, it's applied on at least three databases and reviewed by at least two database engineers. So we try really hard to structure the process in such a way that no diff will left, is left unattended and no change is uh, left unnoticed. And we also have some tooling to actually review these divs. So you have a patch and you have the you can put the commands here, and you can say that either your patch is OK or it's marked, is marked is rejected. And if it's rejected, then the developer gets the email saying, OK, you have to work on this patch more. Here are the suggestions of how to fix it. And then they fix it, and then we review it once again. So this makes the process a little bit more streamlined. And we also have some naming conventions for our divs. So as I said, this uh, versioning tool is very simple, very easy, just one. Uh, one, sc one screen of uh, functions. And, uh, but but what, what the power of this tool is that you can uh, put some additional policies on top of this versioning and uh, customize it for your specific uh, uh, process and for your specific uh, company. So in our uh, case, we use, for instance, Jira. And uh, for in the name of our deployment, uh, in the name of our versioning uh, scripts, we have the Jira version of the ticket. That is, uh, uh, we can actually check before applying the div that the ticket that is uh, related to this div is in the proper state. So it's not in the state of uh, still working on it, or it's not in the state QA didn't look at it anymore. But it should be in the state like completed, ready for production. And we also have some uh, names of the databases inside our divs uh, that allows us to right tools to actually locate these divs. So if I say something like, OK, this part of our application, like shop, is currently, uh, we want currently to deploy the shop. We can, write the, we can run the tool, and the tool will locate all the changes for us, and it will present it to us. And then we can just deploy these changes and also verify that these changes are in a proper state. 
and you can also locate a rollback diff if necessary. And for some environments, like uh, payment environment, we do require rollback diffs because there is absolutely we, we want to exclude every uh, possibility of uh, actually uh, the diff break in the database. So uh, this is about the schemas, but what about the functions? Since I said that we have all the data access gone through the functions, we also have to make sure that the functions are properly tracked and deployed. And for the functions, we use the trick that is called the search path. The search path is the feature of Postgres which allows you to switch the function that you are running uh, instantly and in runtime. So here in the example, if the search path is uh, set to uh, first one, then you get one function, and to the second one you get another one. And the function name is absolutely the same. So we use this trick in our deployment to switch between different versions of APIs. As I said, we have one API per week, so each week we uh, deploy the new version of API, and in order to select which APIs we use, we just switch the search path inside our application. Just one statement, very easy. And if something goes wrong, we can always switch it back. So we can instantly roll, roll out the previous version of our database code, or we can just test the new version of our database code before the production application will pick it up, which is also quite powerful, and we use it. And our API deployments look like this. So uh, suppose we have two instances of the application running Java, and they are trying to, uh, so they connect to the Postgres database. And initially, they use the old version of the application. And when we do the API deployment, we just throw out the uh, next version of stored functions, that version, uh, next version of stored procedures basically by, by, by executing these SQLs in, against the database. And now we have the uh, two versions of API, two versions of our stored procedures running concurrently in the database. But the application is only using the old one. The new one is just in the database. It's not used yet. And the QA can test it. And we can take a look and see that it's wrote out correctly. And this the version of the database is really the version that we want to. And afterwards, after we make sure that this is the proper version, we just switch one instance via the load balancer. Um, so, sorry, we are not via the load balancer. We just switch one instance via the search path. So in one instance, we say, OK, search, search path to the new API. And this instance picks up the new API and runs with the new API. The old instance is still running with the old one. And what is important that uh, we maintain the compatibility in the schema between the old and the new version. So every DBD that we try to roll out uh, has to make sure that it does not break the schema. It does not change the schema to be incompatible with the old API. We always say that the new changes to the schema has to be compatible with the still running API in the database. And by giving this, we can achieve this. Uh, step, we can uh, run multiple versions in parallel and actually use multiple versions in parallel. And once we tested this, once we made sure that this thing is uh, working correctly, we can switch the whole application, all other instances to the new API, and suddenly we run the new API, and this deployment happened without any downtime and without any troubles from the database part. So the last part I want to cover is how do we bootstrap the databases. These are very easy since the databases are running in Git, and we actually don't use something like plan files uh, because we have very many changes, and these changes has to be processed by. These changes are produced by uh, a lot of developers uh, concurrently, so we don't want these them constantly resolve the conflicts when modifying the single plan file. So we just use this versioning and we write the changes in such a way that. Uh, so we, we number our database scripts, basically, the, 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 the most simple uh, process. And uh, when we try to ro when we roll out the database on staging or on production, we just uh, use the find command to find our SQL files, sort them by the uh, numbers in the files, and then just apply them to production and do it in one transaction. So if everything happens, you still have the database that is in the same and in the consistent state. And by doing this, I mean by, me, by, hi, by having these SQL files, uh, we can actually make sure that the, <coughs> that the, the current code uh, can always be rolled out on our testing database with a very simple command. So one thing that we also do is the data migrations. And uh, since we have tables that are 
multiple tens of gigabytes in size, we cannot just run update on these tables uh, because this update will probably block other processes trying to modify the data in this table. So what we do instead is that we split updates in chunks and we have a special Python script that can run these uh, updates chunk by chunk and uh, it also can run them in concurrently uh, on different shards because we also use sharding. And what is important when you run the updates and what we were uh, coming across multiple times is that when you run a big transaction on your database, uh, you may not only block the existing processes, but you also, for instance, may run out of uh, storage for your write-ahead log, and then your database will just crash. Or you may even uh, bump up the load on the server so much that uh, it will be unusable for every other process. So we have these uh, things uh, covered in our tool, and we try to control the load, and we try to control the uh, wall storage and we also think uh, that we have to run vacuums after a certain number of chunks because otherwise we will just lose this space and we run vacuums and this is also configured. So this tool is not yet open source but uh, I mean uh, we are just trying to eliminate our internal dependencies on uh, some other tools that we have we will open source it eventually. So the idea is that you use the select function to get you the IDs of the rows that you want to change and then uh, the, sta the second statement just changes these rows and uh, you can set the number of chunks that you use for this and you can also configure the vacuum. Actually in 9.5 it will be very easy, you, you may roll out your own uh, schema migration without such a tool because it has a new feature called skip locked uh, which allows you to uh, lock, uh, to select uh, some uh, uh, rows for update from your table and skip the uh, rows that are already locked. So you may combine this in a common table expression with an update statement to actually uh, get your uh, rows uh, selected, then update these rows and then return the count of updated rows and run this uh, command after until you have zero updated rows, which means that you updated all the table. So in 9.5 it will be much easier, but so far we have to rely on our tools. And <coughs> some things that we only want to implement is the testing uh, of our changes. So we use versioning, versioning doesn't have a notion of testing, but we actually make uh, changes uh, in two different places. We write um, dbdfs for the changes, and we also make changes in the schema files for instance, in the create table. If we want to add a column, we write a dbdiv that adds the column, and we also write the, uh, modify the table definition itself to add this column. So the idea is to combine these two sources and to test that the dbdivs actually put the database into the state that is in our version control system. But so far, we are not yet implemented this because it's, uh, Git is a little bit problematic on how to reach, uh, uh, one, how to find the path in the Git uh, how to find the branches in the Git, I mean, how to find path in the Git from a certain commit to a certain commit. So uh, we are working on the schema comparison tools <coughs> that allows you to find all the difference between two, several environments, which is quite important if you have a staging environment. You want to make sure that the staging environment is the same as a production. And you can use something like PGTab for this, or you can write your own tool to do this. And this is what we are doing. Yeah, and uh, one thing that we also want to do is to handle the dependencies between the schema changes and the migrations. If you want to add a column in the table and then populate this common column with a big update statement, then you don't want to fire update statement before the column is added. So this is also something in the future. And we are constantly updating our open source tools and we are constantly we are trying to present about them in the conferences, so stay tuned. We are going to roll out new things. Yes. So, now do you have any questions to me? Yes? Can you go back to the slide to the links to the, to the tools? With the links to the tools? Yeah, yeah actually, <coughs> those are links to the, yeah, here, yeah. this one. Yeah, I, I will put these slides uh, to the, uh, somewhere, I mean, in Postgres Wiki, for instance. And I will also add the links to some other talks that covers the same topic. So I want to have some comprehensive uh, repository of uh, these practices so that you can choose between them and whatever you all want. And yes? What you also uh, forgot to mention is that uh, we are not only 
checking the uh, kind of reviewing the uh, all the uh, so changes that developers uh, write, but we also provide the training for developers so they know problems that can happen when they create changes. Ah, yeah, yeah. We do this. Uh, Yes, uh, when the developers come aboard, we make sure that they can write SQL, they know what Postgres is, they know how Postgres works, and they are aware of our infrastructure, and uh, this is part of the developer training, so we want to trust our developers, we don't want to be a bottleneck in the development team, we just want developers to do everything by themselves, so we can focus on other tasks, uh, like helping the community, for instance, or writing open source tools. Yes, this is a good addition. Yes? How do you check the, the performance of the queries? So how do we check the performance of the queries? This is a very good question. Uh, first of all, we have this, uh, oh, sorry, I was too fast. Uh, yeah, we have this PGView tool that allows you to view the currently running queries and for how long are they running and also some other metrics. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the beginning. Yes, yes, here. Uh, yeah, it's also open source on our GitHub. Uh, and uh, when it comes to testing, we just uh, we usually test, try to test uh, big uh, data, um, select st big s statements that extract data on the same data set that uh, we use in production. So we try to, we don't have some profiling tools. I mean, there is a profiling tools for PLPG SQL, but we only recently started using it. So. Uh, it's not very very widespread in our company, but we try to provide developers with adequate data sets. So we periodically get the data from the production and populate the staging environment with it, obfuscating it a little bit because of the regulations. And then the developers can test their queries on the real data sets. And this is how we make sure that the queries perform adequately. And we also have this PLPG SQL provider, as I mentioned. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then I will be here. And if you have any questions about our process, about these tools, or if you have any suggestions on, these, uh, on other tools that you use, then I will be happy to talk to you afterwards. So, thank you very much. <laughs>